afternoon, everyone. My name is Janet Hethorn, and I am the president of the International Visual Literacy Association. And I just wanted to reiterate how thrilled we are to be here. But the reason that I came up and asked for a few minutes, okay, I told them 30 seconds, so we'll see, of your time, is I wanted to let you all know about an opportunity to become more involved with IBLA as an organization. First of all, um, you can become a member of IBLA and at the uh, registration desk, there's a little sign that tells you that they'll take your money. Uh, they just took mine, so I just renewed. And it's $60 for a year, and you can go to IBLA.org to find out more about that. Um, but the other thing that's happening is that we just finished our board meeting, and we will be doing um, elections for a few positions. So if you're interested, and I hope you are, or if you know someone who you think would be really terrific, we have four openings on our board. We have a total of seven board members, and every year, it's a two-year term, but every year we rotate those. So we have four openings right now. And then we also have an opening for president, and for vice president, and for secretary. Um, if you want to get started in working with IBLA, the board member is a really great place to do that. If you have some experience, you've been a board member before, and you want to throw your hat in for being on the executive, um, of being an executive officer, that would be terrific. So now that I put that notion in your head, how do you deal with the possibility? Well, you need to simply go to the registrar's desk and provide them the information. They will give you an email address for our uh, communications coordinator. His name's Les. And it's a long last name, so I'm not going to spell out the email address. You can get it from the registrar's desk. And then uh, he will be taking information, a short couple sentence bio, and putting together a survey monkey that will go to all the um, uh, members for a vote. And then the really cool thing is that if you get voted in, um, our board meeting on Saturday will be your very first board meeting, and it's a free lunch at 1 o'clock. So I know you've already got a free lunch, I get it. But, um, it would be tons of fun. So please consider doing that. Um, I'm going to also, uh, I'd like for the people who are current board members and officers of IBLA to have a, to stand up and wave your hand if you're here. Okay. All right, that's our membership coordinator thing. And uh, Cindy is our, Cindy is our, did you stand up? Yes, I did. Thank you. Our um, vice president. And Cindy is in another uh, role that she has as vice president that you would have if you chose to put your name in that, um, running for that, uh, is that our vice president is the person who coordinates the connections with the conference locations and the conference venue. So she's been working closely with Adam here. And uh, we are currently um, entertaining proposals for next year's conference. We do a conference um, every year. We do two of them in a row that are national in the United States, and then every third year we do an international location for our conference. All of this information is on our website, ibla.org. So um, you might also go there. Our bylaws are there, and it has very clear dis uh, descriptions of what all these positions are. Um, I would just like to tell you, though, that um, we have a terrific group of people. We've got a, a mighty membership crew and we're looking to expand. And now that we've had the opportunity to meet so many of you who work with museums, it would be super cool if you could get involved with our organization. We're on the same wavelength, we just haven't connected uh, that strongly yet. So let's start doing that now. Yay, great, thank you, enjoy the afternoon. Enjoying the conference so far. Thank you, Janet, for those words. Um, we have an exciting keynote uh, speaker now, but just let me say first of all um, that now that we have uh, all of our speakers here, when you're leaving this session, pick up at the doorways from the ushers um, abstracts for this afternoon's sessions, and then tomorrow morning before the keynote or after the keynote as well, you can pick up the abstracts for the next couple of days as well. So do that uh, just to 
just amplified the brochure that you already have with everything that's on for the conference. And I want to take the opportunity just briefly just to thank uh, Christie's uh, for um, their support of this conference, thank uh, Steve Zick and Alison Whiting for being here from Christie's, and for the support that they give to museums throughout the country, which is truly important uh, to our institutions and to all of us. Also, the University of Toledo has worked very closely with us from the Department of uh, Communications and the Arts, um, right through to um, all uh, parts of the, of the university, especially the Honours College. Uh, and on behalf of uh, the museum, I thank Nagi Naganathan, uh, President, and uh, John Barrett, Provost, and Deb Davis, Dean of the College, uh, for all their support. The conference, and I know that you've been enjoying the food um, and all the um, largesse that we try to provide here, um, is enabled by the fantastic donors that we have and um, who love this museum with a passion, with their time, uh, with their support, and with all their dedication. And I particularly want to thank uh, Sarah Jane and Bill Dehoff. Um, I want to thank uh, Deacon and, and Hope Wells um, and the ProMedic organization for the way that they've supported the conference. So with all of those, uh, um, I want to make sure that you understand that they make this possible for us. And um, so thank you to them. You might give them all a round of applause. <laughs> I'd like to start by uh, sharing some descriptions that people have used about this afternoon's speaker uh, and her work. Exquisite. Scarce, brilliant, officer of the order of the British Empire, said with emphasis by an Irishman. <laughs> um, these are adjectives that an artist would often take a, a lifetime to learn and to earn. But our keynote lecturer, Magdalene Dundo, for her this kind of praise is indeed standard to meet her, she's the most humble of people. As an artist, she pushes boundaries. She's taken ceramics and she's freed them from restraints of functionality, raising them to the highest levels of sculpture. And her beautifully handcrafted vessels are known for being voluptuously shaped and almost impossibly smooth. They're also known for smashing auction records one of her works recently became the most expensive ever sold by a living British ceramicist. In recent times, she started also to work with glass. She was born in Nairobi, Kenya, educated in India and Kenya, and lives and works in Surrey in the United Kingdom, where since 2001, she's been professor of ceramics at the Surrey Institute of Art and Design of University College. You can understand that the task of reinterpreting an African pottery tradition that's at least a thousand years old is at once invigorating and also humbling to Magdalene Redondo. She once said that, like an alchemist seeking to make gold, I continue to seek to create that ultimate, elusive, simple vessel which will hold magic for me. It seems that the world has found the magic in her vessels many times over. Can you please join me in welcoming to the Theatre Museum of Art and your international conference, Magdalene Odonga. introductions like this as an artist I just feel like I should retrieve back into my studio and hide there. <laughs> but seriously I'd really like to thank Brian for getting in touch with me and also for the uh, Toledo Museum of Art and everybody who's uh, worked to getting me here. I know it's been a very tight schedule because I just finished in installing my uh, glass installation at the National Glass Centre in Sutherland and um, that's going really well. I just had an email today that it's been so popular they're extending it another three months. Um, the ceramics fraternity is not very pleased because they think I might not get back to ceramics. 
but I'd really like to say thank you for inviting me. This is a grand place. I hadn't even conceived of what it would look like. It doesn't, uh, the, the uh, photographs don't give justice to what the place is all about. Every room you walk in has surprises and it must be absolutely wonderful to work here. I am going to talk um, uh, today, I'm going to actually re-present re, uh, re a paper I presented, with, uh, presented to the African Literature Association uh, three years ago. And it's really appropriate because um, for quite a long time, visual arts in, in Africa as a continent has always been treated as a, as a very uh, separate subject. And I've just left my glasses. I can't see anything, so I've got to go back in there to get my reading. No, I've got them here. I tell them. Um, so what I what the, the the title of um, that I was asked to talk ironically on a, a, a very similar subject that the conference was African Literature Association, but they also had um, within it visual visual arts lit visual literacy in African literature, and so they invited me as an artist to come and address them was very different from all the other uh, lectures. And really I think it's very appropriate because what I tried to do is to, um, to talk about my work in relation to the way I, I've used visual uh, history of objects and visual history of art to actually inform my own work. So in a way, I was addressing the, the, the group, and the group did not have, you know, sort of, um, there weren't that many artists there. So the, in, in my talk was in a way addressing them to consider the art of making objects and the art of making art, or the craft of making art, as a very important part of literature and folklore uh, within African art. So I started off with reminding them that making objects distinguishes us as human beings from other species, as if they needed reminding. As human beings, we are conditioned by a need to make objects. These artifacts and objects we make define who we are as a human race. We make objects, as a result of an inevitable human condition, a need to preserve our humanity, our dignity, and a need to enhance our, human, our being human. We need and we want to make objects. Through making objects, we make and we write our history, the history of human race. In Africa, therefore, for many centuries, all varieties of objects, including granaries, and homes were carefully crafted with careful art, art, artisanship and expressive individuality. Because that's one thing that people often kind of think that, you know, many African art is very intuitive, but it not, it's not individual. Far from that. Knowledge, skill, and practices were passed down from generation to generation some overtly, others very through strict lineages. As in all cultures, objects and artifacts are made cover a wide spectrum in subject matter and performed a variety of functions. As an artist, these objects and artifacts exude enormous power and energy. These objects instill in, in one, instill all in one, and they are potently magical. I use the word magic all the time. The power of a marimba, for instance, a marimba is an instrument, uh, a musical instrument. Incidentally, my son is called marimba. The power of a marimba made out of the good is, a, is as powerful to a mganga, a, a healer, or otherwise, as it is a musical instrument. A cow horn played as a lament to a disease 
relative even more so, even more amazing. These Tukana wrist, this Tukana wristband or Tukana wristbands and rings are beautifully forged metal works. The edge of the wristband wristbands are carefully rendered safe, if you can imagine, by a well-constructed band of hide, cleverly and neatly fitted on both the inner edge where it comes into contact with the wrist and flesh. Meanwhile, on the outer edge, the leather sheet can be removed with incredible accuracy and speed to transform these beautiful objects into lethal weapons. When I first saw these and other decorative adornments years ago in the National Museum of Kenya, Nairobi, their power to inspire admiration then was tinged with awe, as they do for me even now. Those sharp, polished trinkets, worn with pride and used in performance, peaceful or warring, had me on edge. The same edges, edges were later to translate as sharp rims in my own work. Like the Tukana metal smiths, due regard for the clean, sharp little edge, my rims take hours to get right and perfect. The detailed attention given to that feature of the work is especially important in the process of making a three-dimensional piece. And that's where my, vis my visual um, attention to whatever I see is very important uh, while translating it into the work. When creating the piece of work, this adds to animate the object and aesthetically it allows the viewer to make contact with the work and to draw their imagination to the complex emotion experienced by the artist during the process of making the thing. The extreme edge is the first contact the viewer has of the work. The edge thus gives context to the particular work. As an artist, seeing or imagining the Tukana and the Dinka dawn and be decked in these object, objects fills me somewhat with electrifying fascination in making work related to the body. To relate to such artifacts allows one to begin to understand the culture of the people through these objects. These objects tell their story and one is given a glimpse of how their history has been shaped. The artist in me draws a nuance on nuances of that object, and in doing so, one learns of the human nature and human thinking and philosophy. The fact that the dual function of the Tukana bangle fascinates and repels adds to the excitement one has in handling these objects. The wristband or the bangle and the ring are jewelry worn as such, but turned into weapons the band becomes a knife to slash a throat and the ring to gouge out um, an eye. Just imagine. The objects have an aesthetic appeal as fashion accessories. However, when you understand the culture of the wearer, you become aware that these objects are devastating and destructive. These objects have an element of erotic, lethal sensation Conceived as jewelry, they beautify. In anger, they have the power to harm. You can feel the heat, the heart pulsate with excitement when you, when you were to witness the frenzied dance enacted during a ritual with the dancers bedecked in knife wristbands, knife rings, knife ankle bands, and the bodies boiled with ghee and aromatic oil with the sweat trickling down the whole length of those never-ending limbs. And any of you who've seen images of the Dinka and the Nua, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you can almost hear the tone of the horn blower calling to dance, wrestle, and feast during initiation, weddings, and death. These are manifestations of human need to perform rites of passage at every stage during the cycle of life. Such objects define our identity as human beings and are of material importance to a society's culture. 
Laura Mayer in African Forms at Art and Ritual writes that the overwhelming majority of African art springs from religious rites and that her objective in writing the book is to help the reader understand a mentality that's wholly alien to Western thinking. I sort of dispute a bit uh, uh, that statement because all human beings make art and objects to satisfy the need to deal with the inevitable passage in life that characterizes our condition, that which is lived and is extinguished at death. This is in all of us a human, there is in all of us a human need to wish to mark these with ritual and ceremonies while alive and to appease those souls of the departed. So tending for the needs of the dead in visual forms of art is an, as natural to human beings as the inclination observed within elephants to return because of uh, to return to their dead because of the need to celebrate by reburying the bones of their dead, to mourn and to exercise themselves uh, of the spirit of their dead. I'm certain that the majority of Western art making is as much derived from religious rites as it is of other cultures. One only needs to enter the, any church to see the icons depicting joy and suffering all cherished and adorned. In 1995, during a residency in Detroit, at the Detroit, uh, Institute, Detroit Art Museum, I, I was reminded of one of the most contentious cases of looting of Kenyan sacred artifacts, old and new. The rapid disappearance of Vigango from Michikenda. Now Vigango, uh, I'll explain it. The, the Michikenda may not be able to revive the Gohu. It's a, Go, Gohu was a secret society that um, kind of celebrated the spirit of the dead. Um, not so different from, uh, if you imagine, uh, erecting a tombstone um, a year after uh, the dilapidated, you know, sort of making it in marble or whatever. However, these powerful sculpt these these sculptures are powerful, unique, and marked, and all often marked the landscape which defined the Michikenda cultures. And the Michikenda cultures come from the, the coastal area of, of Kenya. And it's a group of different tribes referred to as Michikenda. Each one of these sculptures, the one I think it is to your left or right the piece of wood. Each one of these sculptures, some 120 to 240 centimeters high, approximately four to six feet tall, or taller in the status of the girl who was prominent in society, stood individually with haunting eyes and expression and told the story of that person and that of the society the person came from. The pieces were often adorned with vertical and horizontal geometric designs. These powerful images also came to play in my own work as seen in kind of the following images. In my own work, the need to embellish the vessel is driven by the fear of being haunted by the gazing eyes of the Vigango. I grew up at the coast, and so I'm kind of, although my antecedents came from the the lake area, uh, the coast is really where I know I come from. I knew as a child growing up at the coast of Kenya that one always needed to deal with the dilemma of being bewitched. And more than just being superstitious, one always needed projectiles to protect oneself of the evil, jealous eye. It's like going to church, it's a belief that one is reading themselves of that act of being bewitched. Nobody dies a natural death in Africa. You're bewitched or somebody killed you by just looking at you. Witchcraft is an interesting subject and I've, I've, I've referred to it a lot in my own work. And much of art is derived from this practice. The art is potent and powerful. In my work I have thus tried to contain and at the same time I contain the potency contained in the 
the Gango imp and my own vessels. However, each exposure through travel, migration, displacement, consequently leads to a kind of a mongrel identity in me, in my work. But there's always a comfort in making work that has a cosmopolitan edge for me. The exposure to universal influences therefore allows one, one's own work to reach out and beyond the very confines of cultural identity, sorting the objects that were first were the first point of contact at the beginning of my art making. And this is really very important because people have kind of tried, or the art critics have tried to, to couch me in, in a certain areas and they get baffled because they, uh, they struggle. Without these objects and the material culture, and I'm very, and in, in that sense, I'm kind of very, um, if, if, if at all there's a word, African. I'm very African, I'm very uh, grounded in that culture because I was brought up with people, uh, you know, parents and relatives who really care for the social structure, the rites and the rituals and my own parents, both of them died when I was young. The rite of passage remain a very, very important um, art inspiration for me. I feel that without those objects and that material culture I came to identify with, I would have no culture or indeed a society to identify who I was. As an artist, one is aware that in a contemporary creative culture, one's experiences and work can reflect influences from without one's identified cultural background. I'm therefore minded that works and histories of other artists bring different nuances to one's work. When I painted in the early part of my career, because I was trained as a commercial artist and I painted, I was aware of artists like Vincent Malangatana, Elimon Jao, and Abladi Glava. The use of things and recycled materials in Elena Sui's is a testimony to the enduring allure of objects, but also their importance to us. And I emphasize objects because uh, there is a huge uh, distinction quite often with object making and making of art and art installation. So those of us who make ceramics and pots kind of have to fight our little corner with those people who make wonderful installation, void art, as I call it. Here selected examples of work which may or may not have had an impact on my own work, just as objects written about in the in this essay, find ways of inhabiting my imagination, so do the spirit and charm detected in the work of these artists. Ellen Atsui, <coughs> La Chienne by Alberto Giacometti, made in 1951. I've watched this, I, I go to and from watching this piece of work. I've always liked it because it always reminded me also one of the most beautiful Bambara pieces that I saw in uh, Emily Pulitzer's uh, collection that left me to tears and she wondered whether she'd done something wrong to me. And she had to give me about, you know, sort of another half an hour just sitting watching this piece. But it was just a piece of wood that was carved and it was just illocated, it sat in her bedroom and it, it could have been an antelope, it could have just been a piece of wood, but it had this very Jaco or, or Giacometti has that essence of the Bambara piece of work. And my drawings have always been, I've always liked this minimum way of working, it's very quick um, sketches of light drawings which are done in five to 15 minutes. And, um, usually using models, and, and uh, I've gone to this, down, uh, this drawing class for the last 20 years where we have two dancers modeling for us. 
So that influence comes in, and I hope it, it shows in the, in the ceramics that you've seen, all those ceramics has this very static way of finishing itself. Once it's fired, it's very firm and static. The body moves a lot more. Uh, that's Vin, uh, Vincente Malangatana that I spoke about, whose work I think was, he, he, he died a couple years ago, but he was one of those people we considered in, in the 60s as a surrealist, uh, uh, draw, draw and paint, self-taught, but became very fam famous in Mozambique. So, as an artist, one is aware also that the contemporary creative culture um, one experiences and work and reflect influences. I think I've, I've, I've done that. Um, and the other person I wanted to show, that's also uh, uh, Malangatana. And, um, and this is Alimu Jiao, who's a, a, a Kenyan artist. I've seen him for a long time, but this is crucifixion from Jesus' Martha murals that he did for a church. That's his other work. But there's also sort of British contemporary artists whose work kind of in, indirectly influenced the work that I do. And it's very important, I and mean, then this sort of for African Literature Association, it was very important to kind of try to point out and to show how that that imagery, that visualization from my part goes into my work and also into my teaching. Um, uh, because, you know, there's a tendency to think that you can just take out a canvas and scram scratch on it and, and it turns into art. It really does, as any of you who are artists will know, it takes a long time um, to work out. But that Susan Durge's work were the first pieces that really made me want to use the carbonized effect and to get that kind of variation on the surfaces of my work that enhanced the quality of the piece rather than uh, using glazes which obscured the, the, the uh, finger marks or that contact that I had with hand building. Although I've been, you know, sort of people kind of wonder whether I've hand-built the pieces because objects created, uh, forged and created in Jua Kali. Now Jua Kali in Kenya is, Jua is sun, Kali is, um, I think translated, is harsh. And uh, they, they're like sweatshops, the equivalent to, to saying you work in a sweatshop. And everybody sets up um, and creatively and they, they start chipping on uh, stone or, or forging uh, metal work. And each time the workshops in Kenyan market, for me, inform um, of the history of what is happening to the people in that particular moment. We learn of implements and objects the society needed at that time and have a glimpse into their activities, economic, cultural, and political. These objects give us an idea of the trends and the fashions of that particular period, and we learn of innovation and creativity in these cultures and these centers. To my amazement, in 2007, I was so excited I went to Ghana to, to because it was, Ghana was one of the first African countries to gain independence. But in that year, we learned a great deal of the politics of Ghana through textiles. 2007, as I said, was the 50th independence celebration for Ghana and the two years, years anniversary of the abolishing of the slave trade by the British. The latter event was also being remembered in the country. But instead of appointing Ghana's Kente weavers to weave commemorative textiles to mark this event, guess what the government did? The government gave the commission to print copies of Kente cloth to China. I have no information of what the return favor to the people of Ghana was. 
appointing weavers with generation of skills would have acknowledged and celebrated centuries of a unique art form and its makers. The economy of the makers would have been supported and enhanced. It would have made commercial sense, but then African politicians are notoriously foolhardy and are prone to irrational, to be irrational in decision making in matters of heritage and historical legacy except those affiliated in acquiring fleets of Mercedes Benzes for motorcades and parades. Ironically, evident at the parade and celebration for independence, the president, the president and his wife and officials were often visibly bedecked in kente cloth and kente artifact. In the artistic community, kente strip weaving is considered in high regard for its intricate and artistic attribute. Wouldn't it have been absolutely wonderful to see it being celebrated? In contemporary work, however, contemporary influences of this traditional Kente cloth is seen a lot in Ellen Atsui's work and can be seen. And Ellen, I think El still works in Nigeria, but he is Ghanaian and that produced by his students today. Uh, maybe China was cheaper, however, the status of Kente Club weavers, weavers is unquestionable. This piece here is called Achi. It's by Nene Okore, who was a student of uh, Ellen Atsu. It's, I think I, I read, she's one of the young generation of artists whose work I really like. My interest in material, culture, material, material and cultural object, objects was instilled in me from a very early age. My paternal grandfather was enthroned and also entrusted with overseeing a ceremony we called Nahafka in our own region. And it's long-winded, I won't start to explain. All I know is that whenever we have the anniversary, we have a huge wrestling competition competition as well. Um, but he was entrusted to, to uh, look after the shrine and all the traditional rites and ceremonies pertaining to this known and specific tradition to the Banyalas of Southern Musia. The shrine then considered of a set of drums, carved and decorated wooden seats, spears, shields, and earthenware pots. The initiated, the initiated were never allowed to go into the inner sanctum, and that included women. He would recount the legend, legend of Nahabka to those of us who cared, who were researching the customs, and when he did, he would insist on wearing his full regalia, even though there wasn't a ceremony. And the regalia was, regalia was made up of a cowrie shell, skull cap, so you can imagine, I just want you to picture this. A cowrie shell skull cap, a colorless monkey fur tiara, and a vest made of fur and cowrie shells. He owned a sickle embroidered in beads and carried a spear and shield. The large earthenware vessels, both inside and outside the shrine, contained strong beer for the Nahaka ceremony. The sight left a powerful imagery with me and, a, and is as vivid today as it was then and is most likely enacted daily in my own work. These heritage augmented with those from museums have helped to enhance my aesthetics. This continued enriching experience is used when making comparative studies of, cult of material culture of other societies it makes it easier to understand how the making of objects has a universality and commonality that we all can relate to as human beings. The importance of an object making is, manifest, is a manifestation of our human history. I think these objects define us as thinking human beings with emotional needs. We are dependent on these objects for our utilitarian use. 
They are also more important in, in that their beauty enhances our appreciation of who we are. I just love the idea of making these objects. They become art, and most of the objects that are made like these goods become art only because we assign the status to the objects for whatever reason. The history of culture, this, this is a wonderful apron, it's not a great image from uh, the National Museum of Kenya. The history of object making is inspiration and it's a, a legacy passed on in as many centuries. We have continued to fabricate things as human beings have made for thousands of years and merely adapt to technology and fads of the moment. In the present, artists merely capture nuance in the moment and arrest a sense of happening of that time, hoping that it hoping that what is made continues to inspire, becomes timeless, and tell its own, his, its own story. For me, this history and tradition of making object is our history today and tomorrow. And for the, museum of Nas the National Museum of Kenya, which is striving to become a, one of the best museums in, in Africa or in East Africa, that museum and museums in Nairobi are custodians of that history. And I suspect all museums in the world. <coughs> but apart from the concept of a vessel as a main focus in my own work, I'm also consumed and preoccupied by the, by the body and its embellished glory. For me, the human body is the object of my muse. The preoccupation of the altered, the preoccupation of the altered body, um, the preoccupation of the altered body fascinates me. I'm often reminded of the elegant, young, very pregnant woman stepping off a train and delicately negotiating steps on her way up towards the station exit. The stance and poise struck by this young girl was captivating. She had her hair pulled back in a bun, just like a ballerina. She had the most sumptuous, voluptuous, and perfect body form. She wore the tallest high-heeled shoes, and that and, and and that swing from her hips right and left created a movement that was electrifying. I think everybody at the station was watching me watch her. The sight was sensational and exciting. This was both an object and a vessel with a sense of power. It contained with it, within it both life and beauty, a perfect pot, vessel, and a form of art, a perfect object I wanted to inspire me. It was the enlightenment I had needed for that time. I felt the experience to be a transformation. This lady, who I never know, and I will never know, had unwittingly become my muse. She will never know that this fact and that I continue to rework her in my forms. I make use of the adornment as a reference to embellish the work and to give them life. I keenly watch movement and subtle changes made in the world fashions, sourcing all these ideas to add nuance to my work. I delight in making observations of human habit to change the shape of the body through dress, headdress, binding of feet, tight and short skirts in raffia silks, traditional classical and contemporary, using global references from Africa, South America, Laos, India, and elsewhere. Sometimes the derivations are manifest and obvious in my work, but I hope that in most cases the evidence is subtle and simply gestural. Being an artist is a privilege, and for me it's not to be taken lightly. And I'm just going to go through some of the work that 
I leave you to kind of try to make reference of that wonderful lady. She must be about 40 or 50 now because it's a long, a long time ago. very fast when I'm showing my work, so if you want me to, to go slow, I just shout, because <laughs> I don't know what to say about them. This one is actually very close. It's at Cleveland Museum of Art. This piece has a nice history because it went to India, well, not nice, very nice. It went to India on an exhibition by British Council. And the young curator was so excited. She was wearing one of her beautiful saris. She was so excited about it, she pulled her future husband to show her the work and the sari went like that. <laughs> and the piece went down. She did marry him. <laughs> And as I get towards the end, I'm sort of in, you know, again, I reiterate, in my work, I've always aspired to capture in vessels the power charged in the essence you sense of an African crowded market, particularly depicted by a bloody lover, a Ghanaian artist whose work is really not very well known, but, I mean, you can sense anybody who's been to uh, Mokola Market in Nigeria or Lagos or uh, Nairobi, the crowd is just really amazing. Um, and I think those scenes uh, that one feels could explode so readily if provoked uh, in the slightest provocation remind me of the Dinka and the Lua and um, the Karamoja ceremonies because you still can get um, times when you go to these places and they, they actually are celebrating these ceremonies. Um, they are scenes pulsating with noisy movement interspersed with hushed whispers of a child selling sweets or sugar cubes. In some countries, these markets hold the key to an artist's library. All kinds of objects, shapes, and color to draw from exist here. The cultural variation of each country give the people and their material objects a uniqueness that makes us an interesting group and also individual histories very different from other species. In my extensive travel, I find some similarities, that more similarities than differences. This is the Miao costume seen here, are made from dyed and woven fabrics. Similar techniques are found in South America and so forth. That sense of universality is what I try to capture when making my own observations. And that's really sort of the, the gist of how I was trying to get them to understand uh, how an artist's mind and an artist's solitude in their studio can kind of perhaps be depicted in literature. They were interested in seeing how uh, uh, they, they can work with us artists in, in their own work. Uh, I'm just now going to kind of show you a few uh, images of uh, work that I've currently been making. Um, I've, had the opportunity to go to work at the um, Tacoma uh, Museum of Glass a couple, maybe three years ago now, they invited me as artist in residence. I had been working very much, um, doing some research work in 
at the Petrie Museum, uh, University College of London Museum, and uh, trying to get inspiration for my own work. I've always been fascinated by the lake, the lake area, which is where my antecedent, which, which is where home is. And in most cases, out in Africa, home is where your ancestral home is, and it never will become something else. Uh, so we come from the lake area, and I was fascinated listening to um, a program on BBC where Egyptians were arguing that uh, the River Nile is theirs, and it's by right theirs, which perplexed me because the River Nile actually is made up of the white and the blue Nile from Ethiopia and from uh, Western Kenya. And they were really uh, disputing why Ethiopia was building a dam. As if Ethiopia doesn't need electricity. Uh, because it would disturb the, the flow of, uh, of the Nile to the estuary. But I've been fascinated because the Dinka, the Nuas, and all the people who, who kind of live along the Nile have always had this very interesting cultural uh, manifestation in the objects they make for themselves. You find the Omo, the Oromo, and right up to when, it, when the Aswan Dam had not been built, the houses were very beautifully decorated. So, the, so there's something about finding a loot that you can actually find a hieroglyph that confirms that there was a loot that was very similar in East Africa to the loot that is on a hieroglyph. In, in, in the pyramids, and that that history of that area is, is interlinked. So when I, I, I was working in the museum, this is the piece that I drew for the installation, but the inspiration came from this little, um, less than an inch, ear stud that was made in glass. These are 5,000 BC, and they're made out of, you have a clay mold inside, and then it's like flame, you know, flame worked uh, glass, and it's wrapped around. And to think that this technology existed in that time, and visually, to go into the museum and find that maybe many people would have kind of just looked at them, anthropologists would have delighted in them. But for me, it linked up, and it, it, it completed my quest. Well, it hasn't completed the quest, but it started a quest to try to understand East Africa with a little bit more than just making the, 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 the work. I did get terribly subsumed making the work and it's, it's, it ended, it also has this air kind of, um, I wanted it to have this listening capacity and you know the air Imagine so the, the, the lake listens to all that goes on in all the countries that surround that, and the idea was that at each at each meandering, I would have a culture and its history, and I would depict that on glass. Of course, I ran out of time, and had ended up making this installation, and it was at the at the Tacoma Museum of Glass for about three months. And the foray to glass has been an interesting one for me because it, it kind of enables me to have, to bring back this visual imagery that I'm talking about, but it enables me to, to go out and uh, really sort of work harder because I don't still understand glass as such. I know that it has this clarity and I used to be very confused at the allure of glass and this kind of clear, I mean, we live in glass houses these days. It, it conceals, but it reveals. And it's got this magical illusion. It's got a nothingness to it, whereas ceramics has a solidity. I feel very comfortable and, you know, the ceramics is much more intimate. So working like this enables me to work big. And because other people helped me make the work. So this piece was called uh, Metamorphosis and Transformation because it started from those little ear studs 
and it just kept morphing and morphing and, and uh, the glass makers were also getting more excited and they were just making it. In the end, they started enjoying it more than I was because they just got excited about uh, making the work. I then got invited, word got round, and I got invited to another residency in England in, at the National uh, Centre for Glass and University of Sunderland to take part in an exhibition of, that was called Kip and Kim Two, And I made this piece called Transition One because I thought that was, I called it Transition because I thought that was it. I was transiting through this glass travel and the acne of glass and I was going to emerge from that and make ceramics. I did have an exhibition last year, but I then got invited back and I started making transition two. And this transition two is the one that I've just installed and it consists of a thousand hand blown objects, a thousand and one actually. And this is the installation. The wonderful thing about working this way in glass is you work with a team of people. It's like theater. Ceramics is not theatrical, it's very serious. <laughs> so, so having a theater and having to visualize, I mean, there's a language here that one has to understand because I'm working with, you know, sort of, I have in mind what I think I want, but I have to visualize it. Fortunately, you have these young people, they are not five-year-olds, they are 20-year-olds who know what something called rhyme is called, called. So you can give them a piece of drawing and they transform it for you. So this young girl transformed my piece to this. And it's just been an incredible experience that has left me occasionally just you know, in tears because people have been going in there and saying, wow, we, you know, sort of, but I think, as, as one of the Jeff Samiento, a uh, uh, colleague who works there, said, only I could kind of generate, and, uh, and it's only I who could get the museum to allow me to do this, because they had to build that structure. Because if the ceiling doesn't have it, it's, it's, um, doesn't have any beams or anything, it's false. And so we had to build the structure. That's why, unfortunately, we have the stresses and the pipes down to hold all the pieces. And um, this is actually what you see when you come in, because it's, it's um, darkened and lit like that. But it swirls around, and um, unfortunately, through health and safety, they have stopped us having people walking around and lying underneath it. I don't like health and safety people. <laughs> <laughs> Except at Toledo. <laughs> so I, I then had to spend, I mean, the, the, the lighting guy came in and he thought he was just going to light. He was allowed two hours. And I said, um, I don't think so. So we had three days working on the light. Because it's very important, there was the, the, the first light was very sharp and, uh, the, you know, for instance, kids with, um, uh, what's it called, um, who have problems with, with balance, you know, if the lights shine directly into their, uh, into their faces, they, you know, so, so we had to really get it right. But it looks spectacular, even if I say so. And, and what is good is that everybody who goes in there has their own references. I mean, I have many references when I was making this piece because some of them come from the fact that at one stage I did a lot of rock climbing and I did uh, pot bowling. I don't know how I did it, but some, now I don't really like being enclosed. Uh, and I love stalactites and you know, stalagmites and things like that. And I've traveled a lot. And some of it has, you know, sort of uh, the, the 
glass people from Venice want to make feel that it's got a Gothic cathedral like Gothic feel to it. The person who's writing about uh, writing the catalog says it, it has very mixed emotions for her. It has a death, deathly kind of feel to it, and uh, some of them feel like it's bird like. And 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 I think it's very appropriate for this particular conference and, and, and uh, meeting that work allow, you know, we allow people to actually not necessarily be affirmed by our own uh, kind of ideas in work, that the work enables people to, to enjoy or even to, to, to kind of have negative but the most important thing for me was that the glass was well made. I was really, I did not just want for the glass to kind of be quickly made and then, and then pretend that that's what I wanted. I wanted every piece of glass to be well considered. I tried to actually also involve young students um, to engage in making the work because I think through participation, through experience, through being with me and seeing how I think and, and how I interact with other people, perhaps that rubs off them. But I was very privileged learning from them because there are times, they are the ones who are involved in glass. There are times when they, they would say to me, but uh, maybe you could get this through doing this or that, especially when we were installing it. These are uh, uh, drawings that accompanied an, ex an exhibition that included this piece that you have in the museum. And that piece, I think Brian really twisted my hand for collecting that piece. It's one of my favorite pieces. was an exhibition at um, the Long House uh, Reserve Center in, in the Hamptons, New York. Great, great place. And this is work that I did last year for an exhibition in Brussels. And it's probably the, the first time that I actually had a solo show in, in Belgium. And, you know, sort of why I kind of, in between doing this glass, you can see I'm starting to kind of be a little bit mad. This, this, this piece is very interesting because it really looks like, it's quite big, it's about, um, I think it's about six, 60 centimeters high. And the, it's very, very narrow base, but it's actually very well balanced. It's more balanced than the pieces that I have that have, you know, sort of bigger base. And so this, and these are really old pieces that I, uh, occasionally again, like doing glass, I will go and work on other projects. This was a very interesting project that I did in England, and the, the dinner service was a, exhibited at Dartmouth College when I did my residency as well. But uh, this, again, this connection, visual or historical, is a very interesting juxtaposition because in this room, it's a museum called um, the Russell Coates Museum in Bournemouth in, in uh, southwest London was this painting of Queen Victoria uh, stopping over. She was very friendly. She used to go to Isle of Wight. She had a house, the Osborne house, where she took her family to try and teach them to be normal. Um, because they had a little farm there and you know, that sort of thing. And, um, but coincidence was that it was painted by an artist called William Quiller Orchardson. And 
William Quiller Orchardson's great, great, great granddaughter was one of my foster sisters. And how the hell the history kind of connects people so disparate in society. So I'll kind of in the, in the uh, dinner service, what I try to do is to juxtapose the African experience, that experience of um, using transfers, using the royal magenta color to, to transfer images of my own family and the history of my own family because my parents, my dad worked in that colonial period as a journalist as well and then traveled to India report in the Swahili paper. So it's kind of an interesting thing, but what is interesting as well, visually, is that when people came inside to have a look at this, uh, at the exhibition, they would kind of assume that the, the dinner service was from Crown Derby, and they would get to the table, and it was just amazing to see their reaction. They would go, oh! You know, and uh, the remarks were just kind of uh, interesting. But it gave me the opportunity to try and internalize and externalize the history of colonialism in Kenya as well. So I wrote, there's a kind of a letter that I write to my grandmother about my experiences arriving in England and uh, living there and the feeling of exile or self-exile. I filled the whole exhibition, but this was the, the centerpiece of the of, of, of the work. Uh, it's a detailed piece that's uh, and, and and there was an element of uh, taking William Morris uh, designs, deconstructing these designs and reconstructing them, um, and the fact that uh, we had some of these Crown Derby pieces in our household. When I got to England, I looked at these pieces and their history, and the pieces that came to Kenya were the ones that had been discarded. And But our parents in colonial days would have felt like they had arrived to have those pieces. So the juxtaposition of history, and colonialism particularly for Africa, is very interesting. So I used that as a biographical piece of this is the piece and the exhibition during my residency in, in a Dublin college, totally different, much calmer. But I also do draw drawings. After I did this uh, uh, piece, it's, a, it's a, a, a print, a very large print, um, using a model again. I then found these pieces which kind of had this Feel. These pieces are very old, they're from Mali, they really shouldn't be out of the country. And uh, I've secretly photographed them. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it gives you that sense of history, but it also they're so contemporary. These are so old, but they're so new, they're so today. And if you had a group of children, they would have, I, I think, and I've tried this, they, they just have the same reaction. It's, it's like figures they can make, it's like animals they can make, but we know that they are haunting you. They, they were found in a group, they're probably the equivalent to the um, Chinese terracottas. But they're just amazing. I mean, what were they doing? We just don't know the history because it's not being uh, examined. We just need a lot more Africanists from the continent and curators like these, yeah, like Smooth. Uh, we need a lot more to actually do the work for us. And it's almost an hour. Thank you very much.
really enter, we entered into her world and, and her experience in making the most glorious uh, pots, but also um, our world here in Toledo um, of glass, and maybe we can encourage her to come and make some here uh, one day, which is part of our agenda. Now, I'd invite anybody who'd like to ask Magdalene a question, perhaps to come up towards the stage, and we let everybody else um, go to the, the next sessions that are on, and just starting now in various parts of uh, the museum. And as you go head out, up at the ushers up here, they will give you uh, abstracts for the rest of this afternoon, so you can make your choices. Uh, and as I said in the morning, we'll give you that for the entire rest of the conference. Can I invite you all to express your enthusiastic response to Magdalene O'Donnell? Oh, okay. I'll do that. I'll just... Uh...